As the story goes on, Barnaby's preferring not to becomes more and more encompassing, until in the end it becomes all-inclusive, until indeed it refers to all of life and living, for poor Barnaby would prefer not to. Beja, uh, 1978. Welcome to Strixcast, a podcast where we talk about literature and arts in general. And in today's episode, we're discussing Bartleby the Scrivener, uh, American Renaissance, Dark Romanticism, uh, Mental Illness, and Humorism. The context where Melville publishes Bartleby the Scrivener, a uh, story of Wall Street, is uh, within the American Renaissance, uh, also known as the Romantic Period in the, in the United States uh, of America. Um, and, and, and in Romanticism, we see a sublime nature, we see the individualism, uh, we see a, a religion, the getting away from Puritanism. And we had two uh, subgenders. Uh, one of them being more optimistic and the other pessimist. Uh, the first one uh, being transcendentalism. Uh, they saw in the individual uh, a capacity of doing good. That man uh, is good for nature. Uh, we see in, in nature uh, beauty. We see, like, search for Houston uh, River School. We see uh, a lot of beautiful landscapes, we see a lot of beautiful trees and animals, we see the good uh, in nature. And we have the deism, uh, the concept where we not necessarily have a god, an uh, Abrahamic god that created ha heavens and earth, but a god being supreme knowledge and understanding, wisdom, uh, transcendentalism is a movement where man can transcend uh, by himself, that man can grow by himself, that men are good. And we have the opposite of it, the dark romanticism. You can see Gothic elements here. Uh, just think that we took romanticism and, and put it in it a Gothic element. So they had a pessimist, uh, pessimistic view of life, of nature, if you take um, the fall of the Usher House, uh, Edgar Allan Poe's fall of the Usher House, we see nature doing evil things, uh, bad things. We have uh, fear. We fear the, the nature. In the Scarlet Letter, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne's Scarlet Letter, we have both a critic, a critic upon Puritanism and we see that uh, evil side of nature. The devil itself lives there in the, the forest. Uh, people uh, fear the, the nature there. We see in Moby Dick the, that the evil whale ate a hab's leg, uh, that we must kill it. We we'll see nature doing uh, frightening things. And we see in the individual a capacity of doing bad things, a capacity uh, for evil things. You can see in a descent, a descent into the maelstrom, we see that evil maelstrom. Uh, we see how people feared it, how it was a bad thing. We see bizarre and absurd events. Uh, we see bizarre things happening. We see self-destruction in the individual. We'll see it in Barbie uh, later. So in that context, we see Herman Melville and I will avoid some biographical uh, events in his life. Uh, that episode here is a preparation for Moby Dick, where we surely will talk about his biography. But the fact is that Melville did write stories about uh, the ocean, uh, about sheep, about how he that how he survived between cannibals and those popular stories that everyone uh, wanted to read. But in fact, Melville uh, uh, didn't like to, to write it anymore. Uh, he would like to, read, to write about 
philosophy, he would like to write uh, stories that would make society think in a different way. And that's how, why he decided to write Moby Dick. And we have some letters uh, from Melville to Hawthorne, but we don't have Hawthorne letters to Melville. But uh, I, I quote, Dollars damn me, and the malicious devil is forever grinning in upon me, holding the door ajar. But I feel most moved to write that is bend, it will not pay. Yet altogether, right the other way I cannot. So the product is uh, final hash. Uh, and my books are botches. Though I wrote the Gospels in this century, I should die in the gutter. And he sent that letter to Hawthorne in 1851. Uh, he was still writing Moby Dick. And he will publish Moby Dick first in England uh, and then in United States. While I was uh, reading and studying the critics, I saw that Moby Dick uh, was better received in England than uh, best received in England than in America. Uh, I will quote two critical texts uh, and it goes that way. Uh, Mr. Melville never writes naturally. His sentiment is forced, his wit is forced, and his enthusiasm is forced. If he had been contented with writing one or two books, he might have been famous, but his vanity has destroyed all his chances for immortality, or even of a good name with his own generation. Uh, for in sober truth, Mr. Melville's vanity is immeasurable. But if there are any of our readers who wish to find examples of bad rhetoric involved syntax stilted sentiment and incoherent English, we will take the liberty of recommending to them this precious volume of Mr. Melville's. Uh, New York and United States uh, Magazine and Democratic Review, uh, January 1852. And another text goes that way. Uh, in all those portions of this volume which relate directly to the whale, the interest of the reader will be kept alive and his attention fully rewarded in all the scenes where the whale is the performer or the surfer, surfer, uh, sufferer, <laughs> the, de the delineation and action are highly vivid and exciting. In all other aspects, the book is sad, stuffed, to and dreary or ridiculous. Uh, Charleston Southern Quarterly Review, January 1852. We see that it's not going well. Uh, in fact, it was a failure. Uh, but he doesn't give up yet. <laughs> uh, Melville will write another philosophical uh, book, which is called Pierre. And I just need one quote <laughs> that goes that way. But the amount of utter trash in the volume is almost infinite. Trash of conception, execution, dialogue and sentiment. Whoever buys the book of the strength of Melville's reputation will be shitting himself of his money. And we believe we shall never see the man who has endured the reading of the whole of it. Charles Gordon Greeney in Boston Post, August 4, 18. 52. So he did um, change his way of writing. He's now writing philosophy. And it's not well received. People want that, those stories of sailors, of cables, and uh, that kind of thing. But um, he wants to write about it. He wants to write philosophy. And he wants to pay his bills, <laughs> if you will. Uh, that's why. In 1853, he will publish Barnaby the Scrivener uh, anonymously <laughs> in a magazine uh, in two parts, a periodic, and later uh, he will publish it in a collection, uh, I don't know a word for it, uh, short stories uh, in a book called uh, The Piazza Tales, being those short stories of his, uh, of his home. But let's go to the story. Uh, we, go, we have that narrator. Uh, he is a lawyer and he's got an office uh, where they copy legal documents, right? And our narrator 
will describe himself as a man of profound conviction in the, that the easiest way of life uh, is the best. And that's something that uh, caught my attention. You remember that thing uh, in dark romanticism where men are at all times trying to avoid his evil nature. I remember a quote in the third book of Psythrilogy where we see that uh, Nimbo Cumulo always does the right thing, but uh, in rare occasions the right thing uh, is easy. We see that in his life maybe uh, he's chosen to uh, do uh, the bad thing uh, because that was the, the easiest to be done. I don't know, that's a thing which I, I, I think when I read it. And he will uh, tell us about two of his employees, uh, his scriveners, um, being them Turkey and Nippers. And our narrator says something that is fantastic. Uh, their feet uh, relieved each other like guards. When Nippers was on, Turkey was off and vice versa. This was a good and natural arrangement until, uh, under, under the circumstances. Because Turkey was a, a old man. He was a pretty good, uh, scrivener, but just by the morning. But by the, the, the afternoon, he would like fill the documents with, uh, blots, I think. Um, and that was not a good thing for the office. So the narrator contacted Turkey and said to him, man, go home by afternoon. Uh, you just need to uh, to work by the, by the morning. You are an old man. Uh, but he doesn't want it. Uh, he just wants to continue there working. So the narrator takes the least important uh, documents and uh, give to him to labor uh, by afternoon. And the purse is the contrary. He's a young man by morning he is intolerable he is useless by the morning he says bad words he's readable he's angry with everyone and everything but by afternoon he works pretty well so we can say that our narrator paid for two and received just one <laughs> so in that sense and in the success of the office our narrator needed a new employee uh, so he made an advertisement and I quote, in answer to my advertisement, a motionless young man one morning stood upon my office threshold, the door being open, uh, for it was summer, I can see the figure now, pallidly neat, pitchably uh, respectable, in curl before one, it was uh, Bartleby. And the narrator says that he is a sedated man, he is sedated in aspect, and he sees that that's a good thing to, to him. Like, he has two tempered men, and having that uh, said that men uh, will, be, will be something good to the office. And it was like, in the first days, Bartleby worked like a machine. Uh, he did extraordinary amounts of writing and copying. Our narrator calls Bartleby and says, hey, uh, we need to check if those documents uh, are good. He, there are no, 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 no mistakes in them. And Barbie just answers, I would prefer not to. And the narrator is like, what? <laughs> How? And he thinks he, 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 he heard wrong. So, and Barbie says, I would prefer not to. He's not denying. He's not saying no. Uh, he is polite. He's not anger. He just prefers not to. And the narrator in that situation just think, man, I, I, I have a lot of things to think about now and I can think about it later. So he calls uh, another uh, scrivener and to do that job now. And the narrator tells us about uh, Barnaby's room, right? It was beside uh, the lawyer's uh, room, uh, but they were, their rooms were divided by uh, a green skin. Uh, for privacy, I think. And Barnaby's room had a, a window and the vision outside was a wall of bricks. Like, where is nature? If I look at it outside now, I'll see a lot of trees, I'll see a lot of grass. 
but nature is not there. And that uh, characteristic in Romanticism, uh, that critic, that um, away from nature, men are away from his uh, intelligence, from, from his true personality, uh, if you will. And Bartleby is described as just being there, mechanically uh, working. He doesn't go outside, he doesn't go to the bathroom, he doesn't uh, go and buy food. No, he's just there. And he does not talk to anybody. If, uh, if, if anybody talked to him, he would just prefer not to. And Bartleby just eats like ginger nuts. Uh, when he eats, you know, uh, as the days go on, we see Bartleby being more cadaverous. Uh, but I want to talk about another thing now. Uh, when a narrator was talking to us about that activity of checking if there were uh, any mistakes uh, in the copies, he would say that uh, for sanguine temperamental uh, people that would be intolerable and like sanguine what does that mean uh, that's something very very interesting if we recall the heroism hippocrates theory he said to be the 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 father of medicine like where's the modern but it's okay <laughs> we have in humorism uh, a perception that there is just one illness uh, one disease and that and that was a lack of equilibrium or balance between those humors and what are humors uh, we have four humors that are liquids uh, within human body uh, being it uh, blood black bill yellow bill and flagon i hope i said in the uh, in the right way if any of those humors were in lack or in a great amount of production, uh, that's a disequilibrium, uh, that's a lack of balance, and that uh, brings the, the illness symptoms. But another thing that humorism says to us is that a lack of balance in one of those humors would bring uh, personality traits. We have a study called Bartleby's Melville's Tragedy of Humors, uh, uh, James W. Methods uh, paper. Uh, he says there, each of those adults has a lack of balance in some of their humors. Uh, being turkey, sanguine, a cheerful and sociable uh, personality. Nippers being choleric. He was an uh, angry man. He was irritable. And our narrator being phlegmatic. Uh, and, and Bartleby being uh, melancholic, and you are sanguine if you had a, a, a lack of balance with your blood. If you're choleric if you have a lack of balance in your yellow bill, and uh, phlegmatic if you have a lack of balance in phlegm, uh, phlegm. <laughs> and you are melancholic if you have uh, with black bill. Uh, but we can see in Bartleby some uh, phlegmatic uh, personality traits, like he avoids human contact, he avoids uh, showing emotions to others, uh, he avoids uh, being in any social environment. We see that Bartleby is always lethargic and sleepy. Uh, one of the characteristics of uh, phlegmatic people uh, is that they are schizoid. That lack of range in, in emotions when interacting with other people. Uh, second, Beja, uh, Bartleby has at least uh, schizoid uh, characteristics, but he says that Bartleby is schizophrenic. And we have a lot of stories uh, trying to uh, diagnose Bartleby. We have like uh, Martina Janeska, one uh, called uh, Diagnosing Bartleby, where she shows a possibility uh, in Bartleby being depressive, anorexic, 
or agoraphobic and schizophrenic. Uh, it's very interesting uh, to see it. That's an interpretation uh, to the story. There are a lot of different uh, interpretations uh, you can do, such as a capitalism critic. Uh, but here in that episode, we choose we chose to talk about uh, mental illness and uh, dark romanticism. And in Barbie's actions, we see something absurd, something like, man, is that really happening? Uh, that's a dark romanticism uh, f- thing. Let's go back to the story. Barnaby continues to, to work there and continues to be stationary there in his room. But one day our narrator was passing by, he went to church, uh, it was a weekend, and he decided to go to his office. And he uh, did put his key in the, in the door and he didn't move because in the other side there was uh, another key. And Bartleby just opens up and says, oh man, I don't want to uh, visit now. I just want to be there alone. Can you go outside and uh, can you go outside and return later? And our narrator just says, okay. <laughs> and he goes away. Uh, but when uh, he returns, he would describe that Barbie was living there in the room. He was sleeping there, eating there if he was eating. His life was in that room. And our narrator sees now a, a mortal conflict uh, inside his mind. Uh, Andrew de Banco uh, from Columbia Universities uh, makes a question about it. Where does our responsibility begin and end? Uh, with our fellow human being. Where does the narrator's responsibility begins and ends uh, upon Barobi? Here in Brasilia, Brazil, we have the Rodoviária do Plano Piloto, and there are a lot of Barobis, uh, miserable men, uh, that have had everything denied to them, uh, that the system failed them. And I just think, man, what can I do? And the thing which I do is just fill my pocket with coins. So when uh, these people uh, ask for a coin, I give them a coin. And when my coins, and when I have no more coins, I just feel sad and bad. It was little thing, but that's what I can. I, that's what I, I can do uh, for that society. But. What are the responsibilities you have uh, with your girlfriend or boyfriend or mother and, I don't know, son? Uh, Are you doing your responsibilities? Are you letting people don't do their responsibility toward you? Uh, That can be a a pretty bad thing. Uh, But our narrator sees that and just says, okay, uh, he's full of pity upon... Bartleby. And Bartleby lives there and keeps uh, working there. But one day he would just say, uh, I quit writing. Uh, No more writing for me. I would prefer not writing anymore. And that's what he does. He stops writing. And then the writer sees that and say, "Uh, what should I do? Like he can fire Bartleby or or let him uh, stay there. And that's what he chose to do. Uh, Barnaby keeps living there. But as days uh, passed by, people would go to the office and ask Barnaby to do something. And people in general uh, knew that in that office Barnaby was there and he uh, didn't work, that he denied uh, to do his work. Our narrator decides that uh, he will he will move if Barnaby doesn't go out. Uh, he'll stay because he fired Barnaby and gave Barnaby six days to to go out. But in the sixth day, Barnaby was there, and he decides to uh, rent a new room in another place there in Wall Street. But Barnaby uh, stays there. He doesn't go out in another. Uh, office men uh, rent uh, the office and 
he enters in contact with an oriented man. What's about that man here? Uh, why is he still here? When I rent here, I didn't rent him. <laughs> and Arderia just said, man, I have no responsibility uh, toward him. Uh, that's not my business. And Barbie will be taken out of the office by force. And he will be living by the banister, and the, the stair banister. And here, uh, I see something very interesting in Barbie. Uh, story. I see something Kafkaesque, like just in Metamorphosis, uh, he is a thing, he is a ghost, an apparition, he is uh, a stone, Bartleby is an incubus, he is seen that way, he is not a, a person, he is just a stationary thing. And the narrator uh, talked to Bartleby and said, Bartleby, what do you want? Uh, do you want to be hired again in my office? Do you want me to find a new job for you? Do you want to live in my house? And Barbie just says, I prefer to be stationary. Uh, I would prefer not to make any change at all. He just prefers not to. And he decides to, to stay there. And the police will take him and take him to the Tombs. Uh, Manhattan, Manhattan's prison, and Barbie uh, will be free uh, inside the prison. Uh, he can go here and there, uh, but the only thing he does is uh, walk by the prison and stare at walls. And when people offer dinners to him, offer food to him, he just prefers not to. And the narrator receives a letter uh, where he is called to talk about Bartleby to the police and visit him. And he does that and he pays a man to uh, feed uh, Bartleby, but Bartleby just prefers not to. Uh, he just prefers not to uh, dine. In another day, our narrator uh, comes to see Bartleby and he asks for him and something just says, oh, he's there, uh, he's, he's lying. Uh, there on the floor, he's just uh, sleeping uh, next to that wall. But when the narrator gets there, he sees that uh, Bartleby's eyes were still open. Bartleby was dead by starvation. And that is absolutely possible to happen. If you think about an anorexic uh, state uh, or uh, see death, uh, 32.3, uh, major depressive disorder with psychotic symptoms. Uh, people can die by not drinking water, by not hydrating them, by not eating, by starvation or by suicide. In the end, Barnaby just denied everything. Not denying. He just preferred not to. He preferred not to leave, he preferred not to work, he preferred not to eat, he preferred not to drink water, he preferred to do anything. He just preferred to be stationary, to do nothing. Read Barnaby. That is a great work. Uh, you can interpret that story by your own way and that's okay because Melville uh, didn't say like, oh, Barnaby a story means it that that and that no you can like think what whatever you want about it and in the end of the story uh, the narrator uh, talks to us about a rumor that maybe Bartleby did work in the dead letter uh, office and that's a misnomer now we call it like undeliverable mail uh, and there I work uh, as clerks there, was like trying to find information in those letters. Those letters that can be returned uh, and that can be delivered uh, because of lack of information. So they would open the, the letters and try to find information and if uh, they didn't find nothing there, they would just burn that letter. And maybe uh, Melville read one of these two texts about Dead letters uh, being the first uh, Timothy Quicksand 
dead letters uh, from 1831 or Albany Register for September uh, 1852. And in those texts, we'll see the sad part of that job where you have to burn uh, human emotions, that you have to, to burn uh, love, uh, hate, or I don't know, anything. You have to burn human feelings, human thoughts. And the narrator says that maybe, maybe, uh, that was the thing which uh, made Bartleby uh, become what he became. I don't know, that's a possibility. Uh, and what do you think about it? Uh, thank you for hearing me uh, uh, until now. This episode has a Portuguese version. You can find it in YouTube and Spotify. Thank you for hearing me and goodbye.